Church welcomes you today, March 27, 2022. Had one, had worn. I could see it twisted with thorns everywhere. I could See the pain on his face and the blood in his hair. I continued to think as I worked on the wreath. I could see the nails in his hands and his feet. I could see people laughing, some poking fun, enjoying the crucifixion that had just begun. Jesus had nothing while he lived on this earth. He didn't have a home, nothing of worth. The only thing he owned on that crucifixion day was his cloak which was gambled away. There was no grave to put his body in, the tomb where he was placed, alone from a friend. The wreath now finished, placed on the door, nothing like the wreath Jesus wore once before. And now we'll move on to our announcements. If you'll turn to the back of the bulletin with me. There it will be no Bible study on Monday. Wednesday, we will have Bible study at 6 p.m., and choir rehearsal will be at 7 p.m. We will also have a prayer circle following right after this morning's service, and also the Christian women will meet up front right after the prayer circle. There are also new directories that are located on the table in the back as you leave, and uh, Melissa wanted to talk more about that. So we put together new directories based on information that everybody filled out in October. Um, as you go through, you'll see it's organized by last name. It is people's physical mailing addresses as well as any email addresses we had on file. The last two pages are birthdays for everybody broken down by the month. And the very back of the last page is anniversaries. Um, so everybody has anniversaries and birthdays to send people cards. And we also have April newsletters on purple paper in the back where you get your bulletins. It was also emailed out, so I hope everybody got either the email copy or there are hard copies in the back. Um, if we do run out of copies of the directory, I think I made 25 copies. Um, let me know, and I'll run to the back, and we can run off some more. Now we'll move on to our first hymn this morning, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, page 648, singing all verses.
We are so humbled to be in your presence this morning. Hold us close during these trying times of uncertainty. You are the one true constant in our lives. Let us be in constant prayer for those who need you in their lives. We thank you for blessing for the blessings we receive. One of those blessings is how you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. have a moment of sharing this morning. If not, we'll move on to our next hymn, Blessed Assurance, page 572, all verses. morning's prayer list. Also keep the um, ongoing prayer list in your prayers as well. Family, The family of Becky 
Rogic, the family of Danny Meadows, Amanda Keene, Art Novak, Bob Moyer, Grady Hess, Bradley Whited, Brenda Lawson, Kanan Goodman, Charity Hurst, Claude Branch, David Sims, Destiny Coleman, Donna Marie, Donnie Snyder, Doris Grimmett, Dorothy Cole, Dwayne Keen, Elaine Butler, Ellis Kahn, Global Pandemic Patients, Jackie Blevins, James Lame, Jamie Stanley, Irene and Jeffrey Mills, James Church, Karen Murphy, Katie Fleming, Kelly McKean, Lakin Rutledge, Linda McLaughlin, Linda Scott, Lisa Miller, Larry Puckett, Main Street School, Pam Blankenship, Patty Pruitt, Plane Crash Victims from China, Roy Del Keen, Sadie Mackey, Sandra Owens, Sophia Hagee, Stephanie McReynolds, Haswell County Public Schools, Terry Blacken, Tornado Victims, Tim Scott, Ukraine, Unspoken Request, Wanda Lawson, The Young Family, Zach and Ellie Moore, Jennifer Whittington, and Kip Kirby. And now Reverend Melissa will have our morning prayer. Let us bow our heads before God. Holy and redeeming Father, our fourth Sunday of Lent as we continue our journey to the cross with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. As we see everything that he endured, the blood that he shed, we know, Heavenly Father, that it was so that we, your children of God, who have wandered far away from you, might be reconciled back to you. For everything that Christ went through on behalf of us, dear Heavenly Father, we give you our thanks and our praise. For we know that Jesus Christ was blameless. He was sinless. He did nothing to deserve whatever it is that he went through. But rather, he bore our punishment. He took accountability for the sins that we ourselves have committed. And by doing so, He gave us all the freedom to approach your throne of grace, to receive your love, to receive your mercy, and to receive your forgiveness. We know, Heavenly Father, that we did nothing to deserve such a gift from you. And we humble ourselves before you now, dear God. We admit our many faults and our failures, but we also come and we thank you for the blessings of your love, for the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on the cross, his death, which brought to us all new life. And we pray, Heavenly Father, this day and every day, that the gifts that we have been given by you through the death of Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray that it is nothing that we ever take for granted, but rather we recognize and live each day as a true divine blessing which can only come from you, and that we live each day doing all that we can to help build up your kingdom, to help further spread the news of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and all that he came and did to help your children. As we gather this morning, Heavenly Father, to praise your holy name, we also lift before you the many cares and concerns on our prayer list for people that we know and love, who we know to be ill and hurting, for people on the other side of the world that we don't know and will never meet, but who are going through so much turmoil and chaos. We pray for your Holy Spirit and your peace to be upon them, for those who have experienced the loss of loved ones and friends. May the comfort of your Holy Spirit be with them, helping them as they mourn. We pray, Heavenly Father, so much for all that you brought into being. There seems to be so much chaos and destruction, so many people who have turned away from you. 
We pray, dear God, for your peace to be here upon your creation. We pray for people to leave their wanton ways and make their way back to you into your presence. And we pray, dear God, that we would be the tools that you use to help people do that. As we encounter people in your creation, Heavenly Father, may we extol the virtues of your kingdom. May we remind everybody of the path of righteousness that you have set before us all. May we encourage them to live in the way of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And may we do our best to live by example. Heavenly Father, we pray that you hear our prayers this morning. We lift them up before you. We pray for your Holy Spirit to be here with us now, leading us and guiding us through all things. And may we forever, Heavenly Father, praise your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Jesus Christ set this holy table for his disciples and all of us to come and join in this sanctifying feast where we find grace and peace and reconciliation to God our Father. Jesus, and Christ, Jesus Christ invites all who believe in him to be God's Messiah to come and partake of this holy feast. Would you please join me in our communion hymn number 305, Jesus Paid It All. We will sing all verses and we will stand on the last verse. Jesus Christ was born to die, and through his death we find an invitation to this table to have new life through him. 
The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. He blessed it and broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Do so when you eat it in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, and as you do, do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Most gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the invitation you've given us to come to this your table. And fathers, we partake of this bread that represents your Son, Jesus Christ, broken and bruised body. Help us to clear our minds, clear our thoughts, so that we can remember and reflect on the pain and suffering that Jesus Christ endured out of love for each and every one of us. Father, lead, guide, and direct us in everything that we say and that we do so others can see your goodness in our actions. In your most holy and precious name I pray. Continue this prayer, Father, for the cup symbolically representing your Son and our Savior's shed blood on the cross for the remission of our sins. Let us all think about this sacrifice that was made for each one of us and where we would be and what we would have to look forward to if this sacrifice had not been made for us. Heavenly Father, would you please bless this cup? Bless us in all that we do and keep giving us the guidance and direction needed for your kingdom. In your son's name I pray. Amen. As often as you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim the living Lord's death until he comes again. Let us have a prayer over the offering. Heavenly Father, you have created everything in your most holy image, and you have given it to us. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we would be good stewards of your creation, that we would do our very best to help build up your kingdom upon this earth. Heavenly Father, we ask now that you bless these gifts of tithes and offerings. May they be used to do your will on this earth, not ours, but yours. May everything we do, Heavenly Father, be to bring you honor and glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Know ye not that you're not your own, for ye are bought with a price, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. That's why we have the observance of the Lord's Supper, to remember that, that it, it came at a great price, not that we had to pay it, but that God's Son paid it. And the third verse says, for nothing good have I, whereby thy grace to claim. The Bible lets us know we're all sinners, and we have nothing good, and it's only because of Jesus' righteous, he imparts salvation to us. But it says, I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's lamb. Thank God that Jesus was willing to come as the son of God. He left glory. Uh, he, he didn't have to do that. But he left glory because there had to be a sacrifice for sin. And he came, lived a spotless, sinless life. I know that in some areas they think that, you know, Jesus didn't live a spotless life. He lived a spotless life. Otherwise, his sacrifice couldn't have been accepted. And he made that sacrifice. And because of that, we can have eternal life. And Lida has agreed to sing for us on page 38, 308, There is a Redeemer. So worship as she sings, There is a Redeemer.
beautiful. Our scripture reading for today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, verses 16 to 20. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it upon him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes upon him. Then they led him out to crucify him. When I was eight years old, my family was living in Louisville, Kentucky, and I remember being in school and our school having this huge Kentucky Derby celebration. For those of you who may not know, the Kentucky Derby is more than just the first horse race or the horse race on the first Saturday in May. It's actually a two week long festival called the Kentucky Derby Festival. The festival officially kicks off with Thunder Over Louisville, which is the nation's largest fireworks display. Also included in this two-week-long festival is the Pegasus Parade, which is one of the longest parades in the United States. There are numerous other parades, concerts, tournaments for golf, basketball, and volleyball. There's boat races, steamboat races, dance marathons, a hot air balloon race, formation skydivers, and a whole host of other activities. At Churchill Downs, there is the opening horse race held the week before the Derby, and then all week, Churchill Downs has activities a person can participate in. Of course, then Friday is the Kentucky Oaks race, and then Saturday, it is the Derby. It is a huge two-week-long party. At my school, we began our Kentucky Derby celebration activities a week before the Derby. We made derby floats out of shoe boxes and paper towel holders. We used paper mache and milk cartons from the cafeteria to make hot air balloons. And we even had a Kentucky Derby coloring contest, which I came in first place. And yes, I still have the award-winning picture at my house. All of this excitement in me really began to build up. I was so excited for this big race on Saturday, all the hype about the derby at school the previous week, all the art projects. I could barely contain myself. And then Saturday came. Oh, the day I had been looking forward to all week, I sat myself down in front of the television and I watched as the horses were led from the paddock to the starting gate. I was enraptured as the horses and jockeys were being announced. The University of Louisville College Band played my old Kentucky home. I was entranced. And then my disappointment of how quickly it was over could not be matched. Apparently, I turned to my parents and was like, that's it? A minute and a half horse race? All of this hype for that? I was disappointed. It's, you know, the fastest two minutes in sports history, but when you're eight, like, I just was crushed. Of course, then, when the race is over and the winner is verified, the, the champion horse we see is brought into the winner's circle. It's draped with roses, 554 roses to be exact. And the horse is then paraded around the inner circle and people celebrate. This horse is hailed as a hero and it's treated as a hero as well. In most cases, the horse is then entered in the Belmont and the Preakness to hopefully win that coveted triple crown. And after that, the horse is usually retired to a five-star horse resort, living out the rest of its life in comfort. And these horses have a better life in retirement than most of us will ever know. This is in stark contrast to how Jesus was treated. Yes, when Jesus first entered Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover, he was met with cheers and applause, people shouting out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But that parade, that warm welcoming that Jesus received was very short-lived. We see in today's scripture reading that he is once again paraded through Jerusalem, first from 
Pilate's house, then to Herod's house, then back to Pilate's house. And Jesus, this whole time, he is not being greeted with music and lights and cheering. Jesus was being paraded, but he is not hailed as a hero. He is rather paraded around as a traitor, a blasphemer. He isn't welcomed as the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Rather, he was scorned and mocked, abused and rejected. And he wasn't draped with roses and victory. Instead, he was given a crown of thorns, harshly shoved onto his head, causing his scalp to bleed. Our fourth Sunday of Lent, and we see the fifth wonder of the cross. We have seen how Jesus bled in the Garden of Gethsemane, his sweat and tears falling to the ground as drops of blood as he prayed so earnestly for the cup of God's wrath to be taken from us all so that we could instead drink from the cup of salvation. We witnessed how Christ was brought before Herod and Pilate, and when he refused to answer their questions, he was smacked in the face and head with reeds bleeding in the court of the temple, taking upon himself the punishment and accusations that was due to us. We saw as Christ was whipped and flogged, barely kept alive as blood pooled from his body, and he was unable to stand. The beating, again, that he took meant for us for the sins we ourselves committed. Today we see how Jesus bleeds for the fifth time when the Roman guards and the palace guards, in an effort to make a mockery of Christ and the message that he came to bring, crown him Jesus, King of the Jews and roughly shove a crown onto his head. The thorns of the crowns digging into his scalp, causing blood to flow out over his face. The significance of this crown that Jesus is forced to wear is twofold. The first significance originating in the Old Testament. We see that, you know, God created the world. Adam and Eve were given this beautiful garden, and God told them they could live as they want, they could eat as they want, except for bothering the tree in the middle. Well, however, that crafty serpent was vastly underestimated by Adam and Eve when the serpent tricked Eve into eating the fruit, and then Eve shared that with Adam. We're told their eyes were open and they suddenly could see. When God came down later on that evening to commune with them, he immediately knew something was wrong, and he called Adam and Eve out on it. Well, Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the serpent. And the serpent, we're told, is sitting there looking all innocent, going, what, little old me? What happened next is that God cursed everyone. To the serpent, he said, you will be loathed by everybody, all of mankind, and forever you will be made to slither on your belly. To Eve, he said, I will give you pain during childbirth, and your desire will be for your husband, and yet he will rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate tree from the fruit which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life, but it will produce nothing but thorns and thistles for you, and you will have to eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. From dust you are, and to dust you will return. God cursed Adam and Eve, but very specifically, Adam's curse speaks of the thorns that will plague Adam in a very literal sense, but also in a figurative sense. In a literal sense, any harvest that Adam tried to plant, it would yield nothing but thorns for the rest of his life. In a figurative sense, their lives were now cursed with hardship. Paul writes of this same cursing when he writes in his second letter to the Corinthians, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. The curse that God bestowed upon Adam and Eve not only manifested itself in their efforts to grow crops, but in all other aspects of their lives as well. We're told they were banished from the garden. One son turned around and killed the other son, their life was fraught with nothing but turmoil. And we see that this cursing from God carried over into other generations, like dropping a stone in the pond and seeing the ripple effects. We can see the ripple effects of this curse from God. The whole world went against God, and what did God do? He destroyed the whole world by flood. The Israelites abandoned God, and their curse was they were taken captive by the Egyptians and made to be slaves for generations. 
when Moses saved them and took them into the wilderness, the Israelites were still on the fence about God, and they made that golden calf, and their curse was they had to wander in the desert for 40 years. David did slay the mighty Goliath, but then he had his little run-in with Bathsheba, and that snowballed rather quickly, and their curse was their son died very shortly after childbirth, and David was not allowed to see the temple be built. Jonah spent three days in the belly of the whale, and then a night in the desert without shade. We could go on and on about the curses that we see plague humanity in the Old Testament. But Adam and Eve brought about a curse on humanity that continued to ebb and flow for generations. But now that curse has come to an end because Jesus wore the crown of thorns. That very same literal and figurative nuisance that had been plaguing humanity since the beginning of time. By wearing the crown of thorns, Jesus broke the power of the curse that was once upon humanity. We are now free to live for who we are and as we are in the presence of God. We are able to live a life free from the tyranny of sin. And we are able to live a life that looks forward to what will come in the world that we know will one day be. All of this is possible because of the crown of thorns that Jesus had placed upon his head today. The other significance of the crown of thorns is that while the soldiers put the crown on Jesus to mock him, to hail him as king of the Jews, the truth is Jesus is king, and we know that. He has been crowned the Messiah, and he has redeemed us all through his divine sonship. Christ is king. And by his crown, we are now living a life that is filled with hope. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he wrote, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That is how we had been living before, away from God, away from everything that was good and holy. The Greek philosopher Sophocles one time wrote, Not to be born at all, that is by far the best fortune for any person. The second best is that as soon as you are born with all speed to return from where you have come from. Before Christ came into this world, before he was crowned Lord of all, there was no hope. You lived, you died, you were buried, that was kind of it. There was no concept of an afterlife. You did your best to live a godly life while you were alive and then you were dead. Everything was kind of dark and dismal and decaying. There was no hope. But that is not true anymore. Because Christ wore the crown of thorns. Because it broke the curse that had plagued humanity, we have hope. We now have hope because we can live a life knowing that we at the end will not be destroyed. We know that while the world sometimes might be dark and dismal, it is but temporary. temporary, And we know that there will be greater glories to come in the life eternal. We are now living a life of hope because we know that one day we will be among God's resurrected people and will spend eternity with him in the kingdom and with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ is king and by his crown we are now righteous. From the first letter of John we read, We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps them safe and the evil one cannot harm them. Before Christ came into our world, when people sinned, they had to make that right ritual sacrifice for whatever it is that they did. And you couldn't kind of add up all your sins for a week and then make one big sacrifice. That's not how it worked. You had to make a particular sacrifice for each particular sin. The financial burden was unbearable, so was the spiritual burden. Because it didn't matter what you did to sin or how you made those sins right, you were still not worthy of any blessing in the afterlife. You were still accountable and punishable for what you did. God was seen as being a very wrathful, unforgiving God. There was no mercy shown to those who believed in him or so the people perceived. The sacrifices were sort of a stopgap measure to uh, live a protected life almost until you died. And even then, once you died, a person's outlook for the afterlife was in existence. But that all has changed now. 
Because Christ was crowned king of all, we are free from the punishment of sin and death. We no longer have to worry about what right ritual sacrifices to make and on what day. We don't have to worry about saving our mortal souls. Our souls have now been saved. We are no longer lost and unrighteous who have no hope in the glories that are to come. We have been found, and we have been made righteous, and we will share in the glories of the life that will come. Christ is king, and by him we are now able to experience the love of God. Again, from 1 John letter, it reads, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Because we know what Christ endured for our sakes, how he freed us from the sin that once afflicted us, we are no longer the self-centered, self-seeking, bitter human beings that we used to be. We are now filled with the very love of God, the love that God had for a very, very broken world, the love that God had for his one and only son, the love that God has for all of us that compelled him to send his son into our world, to live and die a very humiliating death on the cross that he did nothing to deserve. The love that now envelops our heart, our mind, and our soul. This is the love of God that we feel in every aspect of our lives, the very love that God commands us to show back to the world. Christ is king, and by his crown we are now part of God's victory. Also from John's first letter, it reads, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Jesus Christ is king. He is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. He has borne the brunt of our shame. He was mocked and rejected so that we would not be subjected to that abuse. He endured the curse that was meant to continue on in the generations that were to come. But God's reign has now once again been established upon this earth. People are beginning to find their way back to God. And that is through Jesus Christ, who is king of all. We see how Jesus is mocked, how he is abused, how he is hailed as king of the Jews, made to wear a purple cloak, hold a scepter, and crowned with a plate of thorns. The soldiers thought that they were being so hysterical, so comical by making a mockery of this so-called son of God. As blood trickled down from the cuts on Jesus' scalp, what did they care? But we know the truth. The truth that by wearing the crown of thorns, Jesus was able to free us from all that hinders and so easily entangles us, as Paul wrote. The curse given to Adam and Eve, the serpent, that is no more. And the crown, while the soldiers thought they were being clever, the joke is on them, for Christ really is king of all. A sermon illustration I found online says, Crowns have always been the sign of authority and kingship. Charlemagne, who historians say deserves to be called the great above all others, wore an octagonal crown. Each of the eight sides was plaqued with gold, and each plaque was studded with emeralds, sapphires, and pearls. The cost was the price of a king's ransom. Richard the Lionheart had a crown that was so heavy, two earls had to stand on either side of him to actually hold it up on his head. The crown that Queen Elizabeth wears is worth roughly $20 million. Edward II owned nine crowns, which is something of a record. Put them all together from all of Europe and all of the East, and all of them are but trinkets compared to the crown that Christ wore. A crown woven together from thistles and thorns, meant to mock, not to adorn. It was, formed, it was not formed by the skilled fingers of a silversmith, nor created by a genius craftsman. It was put together hurriedly by rough hands of Roman soldiers. It was not placed on its wearer's head in pomp and ceremony, but in hollow mockery of ridicule and blasphemy. It is a crown of righteousness. It is a crown of glory. It is the crown of life. It is the crown of peace and power. It is the crown of thorns. The amazing thing is that it belongs to us. We deserve to wear that crown. We deserve to feel the thrust of thorns. We deserve to feel the warm trickle of blood upon our brows. We deserve the pain. He took our crown of thorns without compensation. He offers to us instead the crown of life 
the crown of his righteousness conferred to you and me, the crown that lasts for eternity, the miracle, the wonder that the crown of thorns brings to our lives. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, that Jesus Christ wore the crown of thorns that was rightly due to us, we give you our thanks and our praise. We pray, dear God, as we watch the abuse that Christ continued to endure, may we allow ourselves to be drawn ever closer to his side, and may we fully embrace the new life that we have received because of his death for us all. In your son's name we pray, amen. Christ endured our shame, our punishment, but so that we might have new life to live through him. If you have heard Jesus calling out to you and you would like to accept the new life of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and work within our church, I invite you to come forward during our hymn of invitation number 482, Jesus is Calling. We will sing verses 1 and 2. Please stand. the world in peace celebrating that Jesus Christ is King of Kings and he is Lord of Lords and may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs> 